My name is Mark Anderson and I'm from the University of Virginia and we'll be talking about stress injuries of bone. In terms of a few learning objectives, I hope by the end of the presentation you'll be able to describe the pathophysiology of stress injuries in bone as well as their imaging correlates. That you'll be able to discuss the roles of radiography and MR imaging in diagnosing these types of uh, injuries. And finally, that you'll be able to list the most common sites of osseous stress injuries in the pelvis and lower extremities, as well as those that are considered to be high risk. In terms of where we're going, I'll give a brief introduction to the topic and then spend a few minutes looking at the pathophysiology of bone stress as well as what these types of injuries look like on uh, imaging studies. Then we'll look at some specific sites in the pelvis and lower extremity and finish with just a few words about trying to differentiate a stress injury from tumor, which can be a very difficult challenge in some cases, but a very important differentiation. So by way of introduction, when we think about stress fractures, we often put these into one of two categories, either a fatigue fracture in which abnormal stresses are applied to normal bone, or an insufficiency fracture in which normal stresses are applied to abnormal or weakened bone. Now regardless, these are very common, and uh, about average of about 10% of each uh, average sports medicine practice is thought to be related to these types of stress injuries. They're much more common as you'd expect in the lower extremity than the upper because of weight bearing. And then finally they're more common in women than men. In terms of the mechanism, it's thought that most of these occur to repetitive cyclic trauma to the bone. This is often subclinical in nature so that the patient is asymptomatic until, until relatively late in the process. Now muscle fatigue has been another potential uh, etiology because muscles normally shield the bone from stress during activity, but as the muscle fatigues, more of the stress is transferred to the bone, leading to increased uh, bone injury. And then finally, in some stress fractures, the concept of direct muscle pull on the bones resulting in repetitive deformity and uh, again, an increased uh, risk of stress fractures. So these are all different mechanisms that have been implicated. In terms of risk factors, I'm sure we're all familiar with the runner that tries to increase their mileage too quickly, or someone who starts an exercise program too aggressively and then ends up with a stress injury. Poor equipment, especially footwear, can play a role, as well as underlying anatomic factors such as malalignment and so on. Now, uh, I mentioned that women are more commonly affected than men, and that has to do at least in part with what's called the female athlete triad. This triad begins with uh, one of the components being low bone density, which then goes on to lead to increased stress injuries. But where does the low bone density come from? Well, uh, some women athletes exercise to such a level that they become amenorrheic and they lose the cyclic estrogen uh, production, which as you know, estrogen protects bone and maintains bone mineral density. Another component of the triad is that of the uh, nutritional deficit, because in many sports, especially say cross country or gymnastics, the female athlete is trying to keep her body weight as low as possible, which can lead to poor calcium or caloric intake, or even the development of an eating disorder. So combining a nutritional deficit with the amenorrhea seen in some of these athletes can lead to the third part of the triad, that low bone density and increased stress injuries. Here's an example in one of our young cross-country runners where if you take a look at her femur a little bit closer you can see some faint periosteal reaction at the site of this developing femoral stress injury. Now with a female athlete often if and even with men but especially with females if they have one and especially two stress injuries they will often get a DEXA scan as this patient did. If you take a look more closely you'll see that her bone density in the spine was about 1.3 standard deviations below an age-matched mean. Whereas in the hip, she's just a little over one standard deviation low. And so in uh, these cases, this will often trigger some therapeutic maneuvers such as uh, nutritional therapy and so on to try and alleviate this. In her case, she came back about 22 months later with right hip pain. And if you take a look closely at the right hip, you'll notice that she's starting to develop this lateral femoral neck stress fracture. Now, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, this is considered one of the high risk areas for a stress fracture. And so she actually underwent internal fixation with a dynamic hip screw and a second partially threaded screw to maintain the uh, stability in this region and allow this to heal without displacement. In terms of diagnosis, history can be very helpful 
if uh, the patient has pain with activity that's relieved with rest. Physical examination, though, is usually more challenging because the findings are often nonspecific and it's hard for the clinician to tell. Is it coming from the bone? Is it coming from other soft tissues? Maybe the joint? That's where imaging can help, but radiographs are relatively or very, if you will, insensitive in some series as low as 15% sensitive when the patient presents with pain. A uh, bone scan is obviously more sensitive, but I think most uh, centers, including ours, have gone now to almost exclusively using MRI for these types of uh, diagnoses. Now, in terms of the pathophysiology of bone stress, again, we talked about fatigue and insufficiency fractures, but as an imager, I'm not so concerned about which type of fracture it is. I'm more concerned, am I looking for a stress injury in cortical bone or in trabecular bone, because these will look different on various modalities. So let's take a look first at cortical bone. Here's a netter diagram showing the compact cortical bone. And when we increase activity, we begin to get accelerated remodeling, which is usually mediated by the development of these microfractures within the cortical bone. Now the first step toward healing this is the osteoclast will come in and resorb the bone around these microfractures, waiting for the osteoblast then to come and lay down new bone. Here from the uh, literature, you can see some of these microfractures within the dense cortical bone. And on the next image, you can see an advancing osteoclastic front that's remodeling the bone, heading toward one of these microfractures, again in preparation for the osteoblasts. Unfortunately, the osteoblasts are delayed by a few weeks, and so the cortex may be temporarily weakened. If the activity continues, you can have accumulating bone loss and continued osteoclastic resorption, resulting in weakened cortex. And this uh, peak bone loss occurs at about three weeks after the beginning of this process. So at that point, we begin to talk about stress reaction when the osteoclastic resorption has outstripped formation, temporarily weakening the cortex, at which point the bone may start to buttress that area of the cortex with new bone on the periosteal or endosteal surfaces. And if the, continue, if the activity continues, the microfractures increase, you can end up with a complete mechanical failure and stress fracture of the bone. Now on radiographs, most of this uh, process, this spectrum, during most of that time, it will appear normal. Radiographs, again, are very insensitive. The earliest finding you may see is that of a gray cortex sign. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's usually at this stage that we'll pick up a stress reaction, and that is as you begin to see this development of periosteal or endosteal new bone formation. Obviously, if we see a fracture line, we've got our diagnosis. Well, let's talk for a moment about the gray cortex sign. Here you see a patient, a 30-year-old female with left hip pain. We read this as essentially negative. She went on to get an MRI, and you can see the edema within the left femoral neck at the site of this developing stress reaction. Now if we go back and look with magnification at both of those femoral necks, notice the normal right side with the very sharply defined cortex, nice white cortical bone. If you compare that with the affected left side, you'll notice the graying of the cortex, the slight ill definition of the cortical margin relative to that on the right as a sign, an early radiographic sign of a developing stress injury. Now, these are often very subtle to pick up, and I've certainly, I'm sure, overcalled these at times, but this is in fact the earliest sign that we're looking for in terms of a cortical stress reaction. Now, what about trabecular bone? Well, you increase activity, you end up with microtrabecular fractures kind of analogous to the cortical microfractures. However, we can't really see these because the trabecular bone is just not dense enough to get a gray trabecular fracture or something like that. So what happens next is the bone will lay down some callus at these fracture sites, as shown here from the literature, these little areas of microcallus along the trabecular fractures. So when we look on the radiograph, again, it's going to be normal for much of the process. However, as you begin to form that callus, we may pick up some faint sclerosis, usually a sclerotic band, as shown in this 22-year-old runner who had uh, heel pain, as an indication of a trabecular stress fracture, here confirmed on the MRI. Here's another example of a 43-year-old male with sudden onset of pain while running. You'll notice he's had an ACL reconstruction, and if you look closely in the distal femur, notice that faint sclerotic band going across the distal shaft with some adjacent periosteal reaction as a sign of this stress fracture primarily involving trabecular bone which is confirmed on the MRI.
Now what about MRI? Well the earliest sign we typically see on MR in an area of bone stress is going to be marrow edema. So here this hip we don't really see much on the plain film. Looking on the uh, coronal stir you can see this area of edema-like signal within the marrow very conspicuous as an area of stress injury. Now we may also on MR see the type of periosteal changes I described earlier on radiographs. Here you can see some periosteal fluid and edema, some lamellation of the uh, periosteum, and even some intracortical signal. We may also be able to pick up a fracture line, and that's something that I'm always looking for in an area of edema with a possible stress reaction to diagnose a true stress fracture. And that brings up the concept of grading these um, stress injuries. In the mid-90s, the group from Stanford came out with this grading system for MRI of stress injuries. You'll notice it goes from 0 to 4, 0 being a normal MRI. I can say in my career I have not seen a documented case where a patient came in with pain and had a normal MR. Usually, and in virtually every case I've seen, we begin to see a stress reaction when we see this kind of periosteal fluid, a grade 1 injury. And the stir image above, you can see that area of periosteal high signal intensity there. Notice the T1 weighted image below is normal. Now I want to draw your attention to this small focus of increased signal within the medullary cavity and in the tibia. The penetrating vessel, the nutrient vessel there, usually comes right through the middle of the uh, mid-tibial shaft posteriorly. So don't overcall a stress injury in that region if it's just that vessel. But now here, grade 2, you can see that we now pick up some faint marrow edema-like signal on the stir image along with some periosteal changes, but notice the T1 weighted image remains normal. That's the definition of a grade 2 injury is increased signal on stir, normal on T1 because stir is more sensitive for detecting the marrow changes. Grade 3, we see more intense signal abnormality on the stir, and now we begin to see low signal intensity on the T1 weighted image. And so in this case, a more severe stress injury. And grade 4, we're looking for any kind of signal in the cortex or a discrete fracture line. This was a 50-year-old uh, cross-country coach who would go out and run with his team every week. He came in complaining of what he said, just felt like some shin splints. You can see he's got some very extensive marrow edema in his mid-tibial shaft. And when we looked on the axial scans, we could see this longitudinally oriented vertical stress fracture in the anterior tibial cortex. Now, people sometimes ask, do I use these uh, grades in my report and call it grade 2 and so on? I typically don't. If I see grade 1 or 2 changes within the bone, I'll usually say that's a mild stress reaction. Grade 3, I'll say is moderate or severe, depending on how intense it looks. And then if I see increased cortical signal or fracture line, I will just call it a stress fracture. Now moving to specific sites, I think it's very important to know where these things occur because there are usually very reproducible areas where stress injuries occur and if you know where to look you have a much higher chance of finding these early. So beginning in the sacrum these tend to affect the sacral ala and here you see in this 23 year old runner prominent edema in the left uh, sacral ala with an oblique fracture line in the middle of the edema. Here you can see another patient where it's not so easy to see fracture lines on the T1, but when you see this type of vertical orientation of the abnormal signal within the sacral ala, you've got to be thinking this is most likely some type of stress reaction. Now, in this case, uh, you'll notice that the marrow is diffusely high signal on this T1 weighted image other than where these injuries are, and that's because this patient underwent radiation therapy and now has extremely fatty or yellow marrow. And uh, that is, in fact, one of the risk factors for developing one of these uh, essentially insufficiency fractures within the pelvis. Now, in the supraacetabular region, here in a 48-year-old runner, you can see the low signal edema on the T1 weighted image. But look on the T2, and you'll see this curvilinear fracture line that kind of parallels the superior acetabular margin. And that's classic for these supraacetabular stress fractures, it's sometimes called an arched eyebrow configuration. Symphyseal region and parasymphyseal bone is a very, very common area for seeing stress injuries. 
Um, this includes the pubic rami, the symphysis, and uh, parasymphyseal bone. Now, as you look at this 21-year-old athlete, you see intense marrow edema along the parasymphyseal regions as well as extending into the superior rami. In his case, he was also developing a uh, stress reaction in the lower right sacral ala, and that just brings up the point that you'll often see concomitant stress injuries around the pelvis. So when you find one, look for more. Now, focusing on the parasymphyseal region for just a moment, this is where we see pathology that often uh, results in the clinical syndrome known as athletic pubalgia. And uh, we see this a lot in uh, athletes who participate in single leg action sports, such as soccer or lacrosse, in which they're trying to balance on one leg as they kick the ball, or as in this lacrosse player, as they're twisting and throwing the ball. Now, as they're doing that, one leg is planted and as they begin to twist they're trying to stabilize their core with an upward pull of the rectus muscle and then a downward pull of the adductors especially the adductor longus trying to stabilize that pelvis and puts tremendous stress on the symphysis so in these athletes what we will often see is predominantly bone marrow changes in the parasymphyseal regions as here, which we'll call sometimes osteitis pubis. It's primarily a bone stress injury. There's a little bit of fluid within the symphysis here. Now, as you look at this athlete, you'll see it's uh, somewhat asymmetric with some marrow edema in the right symphyseal region. But this also brings up another point that we often see associated soft tissue injuries in this region. And if you look, this black structure is the rectus adductor aponeurosis, which flows from the rectus abdominis across the anterior symphysis into the adductor musculature. And this is typically homogeneously dark. Now, as you look at this patient, you'll notice that there's some tearing along its attachment at the symphysis, known as a secondary cleft sign. Here's another patient where you see some marrow edema in the parasymphyseal regions, as well as another tear or secondary cleft sign in this patient with symptoms of athletic pubalgia. Moving to the femur, stress injuries can occur in the neck, shaft, or distal condyles. We start, about, we start looking at the femoral neck it's important to separate medial and lateral and medial femoral neck stress fractures as shown here with some periosteal reaction. These tend to do well because that's the compressive side of the bone. If you'll notice it's concave architecture when you weight bear the bone on that side it undergoes compression and so these fractures tend to be compressed uh, with weight bearing and so these tend to heal fairly well and certainly much better than a lateral femoral neck fracture as we saw in our young patient earlier. Now the lateral femoral neck as I mentioned earlier is an area of high risk in terms of stress fractures and here's a list of other high risk stress fractures in the lower extremity. These are called high risk because these tend not to do well. They either uh, have a high incidence of non-union or poor union or they go on to displace and so if you look in the lateral femoral neck, why are these higher risk? Well, because that's the tensile side. When you look at the femur, it has more of a convex architecture on the lateral side. And so when you weight bear with a fracture on that side, it's trying to pull that fracture apart. And so it's a higher risk of propagating further and actually displacing. Now, as we move into the shaft, all right, these are often very easy to miss. They're down at the corner of the image. They can be very subtle. Here, in looking at this patient, if you look closely at that proximal femoral shaft, you see just some faint, very slight periosteal reaction. But we look at the MR and we see the very conspicuous T2-weighted uh, edema-like signal related to this developing stress injury. Now, in the shaft of the femur, there's been an entity called thigh splints, the formal name being adductor insertion avulsion syndrome. This is thought to be related to the pull of the adductor longus and brevis on the proximal to mid femoral shaft. So that's where we're looking for these injuries. Now, there are some dangers, and I think in, clinical, in the clinical realm, these patients often present with just hip and groin pain. And so the clinician is very tempted to just say, well, it's probably an adductor muscle strain, um, and not realize that it really is some type of an underlying bone stress injury. Now, radiographs are also, as in virtually all stress injuries, often normal. Here's an example where the radiograph was not normal. You can see the periosteal reaction here. 
And what do we look for on MR? Well, this looks just like any other stress injury. We have some periosteal and medullary fluid. When we look on the axial scan, you can see the periosteal changes, the medullary edema, and in this case, some intracortical signal indicating that this is, in fact, a developing stress fracture. Now again, I emphasize this may be down at the edge of the field of view, so you've got to be aware and really look carefully there, as in this 14-year-old, where you pick up some very subtle periosteal reaction, which on the femur, full-length femur films, is much more obvious. And again, as we look at his, it looks identical to the last patient, with periosteal changes, marrow edema, and on the axial scans, even a little bit of intracortical signal. Now this is why I think these are dangerous, because I think there's a potential for these to develop into a subtrochanteric fracture. Here's an example of one of these uh, comminuted fractures from the Journal of Emergency Medicine. You say, okay, I don't know why this would be in the Journal of Emergency Medicine. Well, the reason it's in there is because this was a runner in the Boston Marathon. If you look in the literature, you'll find several case reports of runners in the middle of a long distance race just acutely shattering their femur. It makes no sense unless you think about the fact that they were probably developing one of these femoral shaft stress fractures thinking it was just a groin pull or a groin strain and so by golly they've trained this hard for this long race they're going to finish this race and unfortunately they may end up completing their fracture. Looking at the tibia, the posterior shaft is the most common area for a stress injury known as a runner's fracture. Much like the femoral neck, these do pretty well because that's on the compressive side. Notice the posterior tibia has a concave margin. Now here you can see again these are going to be under compression with weight bearing so these do pretty well. Now a longitudinal fracture, I showed you one earlier, here's another one. These are much less common but they do occur and we see these in the tibia sometimes. Here you can see this 55 year old didn't really have a big activity history but we certainly see the periosteal reaction cortical lucency that makes us suspicious of a stress injury. In her case she underwent a CT and you can see the fracture line in the anterior tibia that's shown to be this vertical longitudinal stress fracture. And then finally if you look at the anterior shaft of the tibia you'll notice that this is the tensile surface. It's convex much like the lateral femoral neck. When you see one of these uh, horizontal anterior cortical fractures, these are sometimes called the dreaded black line fracture because they don't heal well. They just sit there and look black in the anterior cortex. We typically see these in jumpers and dancers, that type of an athlete. And, un and these undergo tension and so they do not do well. These can have delayed healing. They may even progress to a complete fracture and may require fixation as shown here. This is one of our women's basketball players who came in with lower leg pain. You can see the uh, marrow edema within the tibia. If you look closely at hers, you can see this anterior tibial stress fracture in July of that year. Now she came back a month later and it looks slightly less distinct than it looks like it's starting to heal and by October it was actually looking quite good. Well, what else happens in October? They start their basketball season. And so a few months later, she came back with recurrent symptoms, and you see the recurrent stress fracture at that exact site. Now, in her case, because of her recurrent problems with this, they went ahead, put in an intramedullary rod, not only to protect this from becoming a complete fracture, but also to try to help healing. Moving into the foot, the metatarsals, very common area for stress fractures, but you'll notice tarsals are a little bit more common, and of those, it's usually the calcaneus or the navicular. We'll talk about all four of these sites briefly. In the calcaneus, it's almost all trabecular bone, so we're really looking for that sclerotic form of stress fracture. Here you can see that this is a nice example of the typical morphology in this 38 year old with celiac disease and low bone density. She started exercising a few months prior to this and you can see the curvilinear kind of faint sclerosis paralleling the posterior cortex within the calcaneus. Here's an MRI showing another one of these posterior calcaneal stress fractures which is readily seen on the uh, radiograph. But the patient came in actually four weeks prior and when we looked back at the initial film where we had missed it. If you look closely, you could perhaps make out that faint, I know you're probably laughing, but you can make out that faint sclerosis. And the whole reason I show this is simply that if you know where these occur and what they typically look like, you may be able to pick them up much earlier than otherwise. 
Now another type of calcaneal stress fracture is the CIA fracture or calcaneal insufficiency avulsion fracture seen almost exclusively in diabetics. Here you see the stress fracture line within the, the calcaneus but you also notice there's been a large avulsed fragment from the posterior calcaneus with the Achilles tendon in this insufficiency avulsion type fracture. The navicular is one of the high risk uh, stress fractures. It's a very difficult radiographic diagnosis. And on imaging, on MR, we may see primarily edema with or without a fracture line. But if you look at this fracture line on this long axis T1, it illustrates nicely where these tend to occur. They tend to occur in the center of the navicular in this sagittal orientation. You can see that a little bit better perhaps on this short axis view where you can see the fracture line usually begins along the dorsum of the bone and usually along its proximal articular surface and then propagates in this sagittal orientation here seen again on a T2 fat saturated image. Now if you see just bone marrow edema sometimes CT can help you identify a fracture line. Now here you can see on a radiograph why these are so easy to miss. There's a lot of overlap in the midfoot, your eye goes by it, but there is this central navicular sagittally oriented lucency which on MR was shown to be a one of these uh, navicular stress fractures. Here you see the marrow edema in the short axis. This one has a little bit more of an oblique appearance but still in that primarily sagittal plane. The metatarsals, as we said, very common location, especially the second and third. Just note that the proximal fifth metatarsal, if you have a stress fracture there, those are of the high risk nature because they tend not to heal very well. And occasionally we'll see uh, our surgeons put a cannulated screw across it to help it to heal and not go on to a more displaced fracture. Now here in a 19 year old lacrosse player you see the typical periosteal reaction of a stress injury. MR shows what we would expect. A lot of marrow edema, soft tissue edema, as well as this transverse low signal developing fracture line. Now in the metatarsal head you've probably seen what we call Freiberg's infraction typically in the second but it incur, can occur in other metatarsal heads as well. Thought to be originally due to osteonecrosis. In these patients on MR you'll see the edema as shown here but if you look closely you'll often see a subchondral fracture line which is probably the underlying pathology in this entity. Now that can go on to develop articular collapse and the typical flattening of the metatarsal head that we see but it probably starts as this type of a stress fracture. Now sesamoid pathology is something that we see commonly in the forefoot. Again it's a high risk area for a stress fracture because these sesamoids don't heal very well and can be very problematic. The most common pathology we see is going to be osteoarthritis as shown here. But these can undergo a stress reaction or stress fracture or even osteonecrosis. So we look for the same type of findings. Here is a 17 year old who started a walking program to lose weight and you'll notice she comes in with forefoot pain and you'll notice diffusely abnormal low signal on T1 and bright signal on T2 in this injured hallux sesamoid. In this case my differential would be stress reaction or fracture in which case I'm going to be looking for a fracture line or less likely osteonecrosis because that can look very very similar. Now again I'm going to be looking for a fracture line and here's another example in a 24 year old runner with forefoot pain. Easy on the T1 you'll notice the diffusely abnormal signal perhaps with a subtle fracture line there. Notice on the T2 fat sat it's extremely dark and in this case I'm going to be more concerned about osteonecrosis. But notice on the sagittal image we see the low signal on T1 but also fragmentation and here a clear cut fracture line within this very dark uh, fractured uh, sesamoid which to me looks like it's probably undergone osteonecrosis. Finally let's spend a few minutes talking about differentiating a stress injury from tumor and the problem is that stress injuries produce very nonspecific MRI signal intensity. Low signal on T1, high signal on T2. If you can't find a fracture line you may be tempted or even worried about uh, calling this a tumor. And so here what we want to do though is avoid a biopsy because you biopsy a stress injury and the pathologist will see some immature osteoid formation and be very tempted to call an osteosarcoma. Now here's an adolescent who came in with thigh pain, played soccer but really didn't have a tremendous activity history. But you'll notice the focal periosteal reaction. He underwent a bone scan and you see the intense 
activity in that mid femur and at this point the word neoplasm began to be uh, discussed with the Ewings or other processes so he underwent an MR and this is an older MR without fat saturation it's a T2 weighted image but you'll notice most of the action is in the periosteum all right and so at this point there was some consideration well wait maybe this is some type of a stress injury and that brings up the next principle in trying to differentiate these and that is if you're thinking that there's any way this could be a stress injury think about repeating the imaging in two to three weeks you may even want to use CT as it's the probably the best way to look for a fracture line so he came back and we were going to do a CT a few weeks later and you'll notice even on the scanogram he's developed this oblique lucent stress fracture line within the medial cortex so here's another example with a 68 year old female who came in with right hip pain you see on the bone scan she has focal activity at her age a lot of concern for a metastasis or some type of primary neoplasm we did an MR thinking okay we'll be able to differentiate this you'll notice the geographic signal abnormality on T1 as we go to T2, try as we might, we could not identify a definite fracture line. So we were getting ready to biopsy, but she had a CT. And you'll notice now clearly the fracture line within that medial femoral cortex. So don't forget, CT can be exceedingly helpful in trying to differentiate a developing stress fracture from a tumor. So in summary, I've tried to highlight the locations that these stress injuries tend to occur in the pelvis and lower extremity because if you know where to look, you'll have a much higher rate of uh, detection. Now, you should be able to uh, list these high-risk areas. And uh, in our practice, if we see one in these areas, they typically... Uh, indicate we should contact the clinician either by phone or by some type of email or inbox messaging. And then finally, tried to finish with a few words about differentiating stress from tumor. Don't forget two things. Number one, if it's in the differential, consider short-term follow-up imaging because these will often declare themselves within two to three weeks. And even so, you may want to go ahead and get a CT and see if you can detect a fracture line since that is even more sensitive for that purpose. I thank you so much for your attention.